Welcome to the first episode of Solutions 2023. My name is Mike Stark. First, don't get married to our name because it will be changing. When I started this podcast in 2017, the show's direction was different than this show will be in 2023. With the dialogue getting more coarse and divided in our country, I wanted to evolve the show into something that will address issues, instruct, and ultimately entertain. Politics have become entertainment. So rather than ranting and screaming, we're going to try very hard to be more entertaining. Which brings me to my co-host. I wanted to have a partner in this venture that was what I call a classic conservative. I selfishly wanted someone who can defend his conservative values and issues without the baggage of Donald Trump and without having solutions that are based on just the other team is bad. So I want to welcome to the show my co-host, Keith Curry. Keith, fill us in on your political background, a background that will prove to be so important in this show since I personally am a political dummy in regards to the mechanics of politics. Well, uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, And I literally have been in politics since I was 13, 68. So I went to a Nixon rally. Uh, Our family started. I actually started working for Gene McCarthy, and we were still Democrats at the time. So I worked for Gene McCarthy in the primary because we didn't like Bobby Kennedy, and he lost. And then we sort of evolved to be Republicans and supported Nixon. And I went to his rally at the airport and was a Republican ever, ever since. So I grew up in the Nixon era. My you know, political formative years were, were driven by what happened during Watergate and the Republicans, you know, losing in 74. I got to be Hugh Flournoy's youth director. It's a name nobody remembers. He was the guy that Jerry Brown beat by three points in 1974 to become governor. Got to know then Governor Reagan. And I ran some political campaigns. I ran uh, the GAN initiatives where every city in California today adopts a GAN limitation of how much money they can't spend or the, the level at which they can no longer spend money above that. And I was the campaign manager as a, at a young 20 something and uh, went on to work for a member of the LA County Board of Supervisors, ran his re election campaign. I joined the Reagan administration and went back to Washington. I worked with Elizabeth Dole at the Transportation Department and then Came back to California and headed the private sector initiatives efforts. I got a job in public finance and went around the country putting together municipal bond deals, mostly for transportation agencies. And so I got to see, you know, sort of the nuts and bolts of how you make government work and not work or you do it in a sort of a non-ideological role. And then uh, eventually got to Newport Beach and and uh, got myself appointed to the city council. I ran in three city council elections, and then one election for the state legislature. I I lost that one. But I've been involved in running campaigns or being a candidate or raising money for candidates. I've got to know, I've I've met every president since Lyndon Johnson and shook hands with everyone except Johnson and Trump. Trump was actually, I met him when he came to South Coast Plaza to sell ties at Macy's. Mm -hmm. Uh, But uh, so I've I've been involved in politics really all my life. and And I've got to know some great people and to to learn from the best and to learn in times when our party was was in the ascendancy and when it was in decline. So I look forward to having these conversations. Great, great. So for those of you that don't know my background, I've worked in some form of audio radio for over 50 years, hosted a talk show in the mid-90s on a heavy metal radio station, and was once a Republican myself until Nixon who in my eyes betrayed me and basic American values. I'm a proud progressive who didn't vote for Al Gore or Hillary Clinton, but thought Barack Obama was a needed change. I think Joe Biden has fulfilled his duties to stabilize things, but would very much like to see some new blood in the Democratic Party. And again, without the baggage that Biden has and continues to bring to the table. So you now know the players and you will be getting to know us better with each episode. So please subscribe and hang with us as we take this great new journey. Over the next few episodes, as we settle in, we're going to use 
Keith's expertise to talk about the mechanics involved in the political game today. So this episode, we'll be focusing on campaign financing. Keith, can you give us an overview, an overall look, and the evolution of, of political fundraising and how it's changed and how it's gotten better and how it's gotten worse? Well, Mike, it's great that we're talking about campaign financing because that is a great bipartisan issue. Both the people on the left and the people on the right believe that if all we do is cut the bad, dirty money off from the guys on the other side, that democracy would be great and the country would be saved. And uh, both sides are, you know, sort of wrong and myopic in their in their in their look at that. But campaigns have gotten a lot more expensive. They have brought in a lot more players and candidates. Everybody thinks I'll just run for office. I'll give speeches. I'll walk door to door. In fact, what candidates do, 80 percent of your time is spent raising money. Mm. Today, actually, I'm using the last of the envelopes from my 2014 campaign. <laughs> Uh, because I had a bunch of them left over from thank you letters that never got written for doc contributions that never came. But uh, <laughs> that's uh, really what candidates spend most of their time doing that most people don't think about. OK, what what are the usual vehicles for campaign fundraising? There's got to be different ways of raising funds. So candidates can raise money on their own. And for those campaigns, typically there are limitations. There's limitations on how much you can give to a candidate for governor, the legislature for Congress. And most cities have limitations as well. The candidates raise that money. They are they hire a campaign manager and they spend the money. The candidate gets to participate in the decisions of what the mail looks like, what it says. I always advise uh, people who want to run for office to say, you're, you know, win, lose or draw, you're going to have to live in this city after it's over. So make sure <laughs> you're comfortable with the stuff they put on the mail. And a candidate can do that on on mail that's sent out with money that he has raised in his he or her in their own name. Perhaps a bigger piece and perhaps the more controversial piece are independent expenditures, money that's spent by uh, other people on your behalf, which by law, you as the candidate and your campaign manager cannot coordinate with. And there's little tricks. Usually you'll have a little button on your website where they can find pictures and they can take the pictures off. And if the police union's going to do a mailer, they'll find good pictures of you at that little button site and they can take those off your publicly available website and use them to create their own mail without you being involved in it. We saw with, with Governor DeSantis, really, uh, one of his independent expenditure committees put a strategy memo in that little box, and it and it got leaked to the public <laughs> with not particularly good results. So, right, right. But that's an example of, but, they, but, but it was there because they were trying to get around the independent expenditure, you can't talk to the, to the campaign manager rule. What you're talking about is now PACs, which are political action committees, and they're outside of the regular campaign thing. How did these things come about? Well, they came about when people put limitations on campaigns, and they came about because both labor and uh, business decided that they needed to influence elections. And this was a way for them to raise money from their memberships to uh, to support candidates. So, you know, some of the early PAC adapters were, you know, business interest groups, the realtors, you know, the oil producers, the, the uh, merchants, the grocery store owners, and labor unions, the American auto workers, the AFL-CIO, the police unions. And, and, and that became sort of the vehicles that they used to w raise money from a broad membership group. That idea was then sort of uh, evolved, and it then became a vehicle for people who wanted to make contributions outside of the contribution limits for ideological reasons, as opposed to business or, or, or those kind of reasons. And uh, you saw the proliferation of, of uh, idea packs or ideological packs, right. uh, often funded by one or two uh, large major donors. Let's talk about the pros and cons of, of packs because they're so, so predominant now. At least it seems to me they're so predominant. They're almost, they almost overshadow the actual campaign funding, right? Right. So, so much money involved. Well, the, the, the pros are they allow people who have a significant economic interest in the in the outcome of the election to to represent their interests. So if you're an elected official and if you're a tobacco company, for example, you some somebody everybody thinks is a bad guy and you're being regulated out of existence, you can you know use a political action committee to maintain uh, your business or industry. And this same thing with the, with oil companies. By the same token, if you're a police union, you can use these 
independent expenditures to make sure the people are elected to office who are going to support uh, contracts that are favorable and working conditions that are favorable to you as an employee. You get to sort of pick your own boss. Right. And and that's sort of how they're 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 viewed by the people who uh, who use them. Now the downside is is that the candidate can forswear any involvement. I said uh, because by law they can't coordinate, and the candidate can say, you know, uh, I'm not responsible for the things that they say, and some of the things they're said are pretty outrageous in different campaigns. Uh, and sometimes it can be hard to track the money because there's various ways that PAC money can be. Uh, obfuscated uh, during the course of a campaign. Let's talk about the abuse, because I think, you know, the average guy looks at these PACs and thinks, well, I don't have a say because I don't I can't contribute massive amounts of money. And I think that's one of the perceptions, at least, that people have, that the money is corrupting the campaign and politics in general. So, where have you seen uh, fundraising abuses? Now, I'm I'm thinking right off the top of my head that uh, there was some of that going on involved in the Watergate situation, right? Because that was campaign fundraising that paid the uh, the people that broke into the Watergate, right? Well, yes, and the Watergate was for the most part before campaign uh, finance laws were enacted, and so. People literally did deliver bags of cash, and there were bags of cash in the refrigerator and in the safes of some of the <laughs> campaign officials. And when they made payments to Watergate burglars, they made it in cash, often consecutively numbered, you know, hundred dollar bills. Sure. So those abuses were addressed in the in the post nineteen seventy four campaign uh, things. Now it's nearly impossible to you can't take cash more than ninety nine dollars from in a campaign. Cash has really been wiped out of campaigns, mm. and there's been a lot better reporting of, of those contributions. But you can still, uh, you know, ping pong money between PACs to sort of hide its its original source. You know, you can get, if you're the endorsed candidate of the Democratic or the Republican Party, uh, you can have a donor give money to the Los Angeles County Repub- uh, Democrats. They will in turn give it to the San Francisco Democrats. The mm. San Francisco Democrats will send money down to your campaign because you're the endorsed Democrat. And it works the same way for the Republicans. Sure. And you never know that that contribution originated in Los Angeles and got sort of washed through those committees without some very detailed research. So you can you can see from what you're talking about that there there are ways of working around the system a little bit. Are there are there things that could be put in place in your opinion that could uh ratchet things down a little bit and make people a little more uh well, at least uh, uh, acceptable of these PACs. The, the, the best reform is sort of immediate disclosure. Now, there is uh, a pretty robust immediate disclosure. If you, within uh, a, a period of time, roughly 60 days, I think, before a campaign, before an election, you uh, have to disclose within 24 hours or 48, or 48 hours, I guess it's the weekend, 24 hours, You've got to disclose the contribution electronically, and it pops up on the city clerk's website or the registrar's website, secretary of state's website, so that people uh, know that somebody has just put a bunch of money into your campaign. Uh, Sometimes that's routed to delay its disclosure, but it it ultimately gets disclosed. That's an important reform because that way you know what's coming and you can sort of, uh, as a candidate, you can prepare for it, and it can be disclosed to voters before the election. Now, does that apply to PACs as well? Yes, it does. Okay. If they're giving money for a candidate, yes, for a candidate to purpose, yes. Okay. So where do you see the biggest abuses in campaign fundraising and specifically, I guess, the PACs? It seems like they've got they've locked down regular campaign fundraising to a point where that stays pretty straight all the time, right? Because of Nixon and right. all of that. But the PACs seem to have enough loopholes everywhere that people can get around it. And where do you see the abuses these days? Well, again, campaign contributions have been deemed by the Supreme Court to be free speech. And so you as an individual have the right to use your money in any way you see fit to influence public policy. That's a fundamental now enshrined American right. What you do see is people with more money, I like to say more money than cents, who decide they're going to write a (laughs) $200,000 check to influence a city council race. I've had that happen to me once. Wow. Now, 
I won the race by 10 points and I spent half of what he spent, but he decided he didn't like my position on where City Hall ought to be. And he was going to spend $200,000 to let me know that, which he did. And, you know, that's something that can be done. On the left, you see George Soros, who was financed uh, very methodically and over several years, the election of liberal district attorneys. And Michael Bloomberg, who has spent millions of dollars of his own money to elect candidates who support his position on uh, uh, guns and uh, on uh, some other issues. Right. Uh, and on the right, you've seen the Koch brothers spend, you know, the same amount of money for people that they believe are, by their definition, free marketers and, and support the business interests that they advance. And, and I think when you have, you know, one or two individuals or groups like that who decide that they're going to set the agenda for a community 2000 miles from where they live. Right. Uh, that that's that's a problem. But with the free speech issue. It, but it's know, their right to do it. It, it's, it gives them their right to do it. So you've just talked about your own example of someone outspending you, but you still winning the election. But money is important in an election. It's it's a it's a it's an important factor, right? It is an important factor. And you've got to be able to communicate to your voters. It is a misnomer to believe that having the most money means you will always win. There are numerous examples where that is not true. But you as a candidate have to have a baseline to be able to communicate with enough voters and to differentiate yourself uh, to overcome that. And a good campaign can do it and a bad campaign won't. And if for whatever reason you are uh, thoroughly outmatched on the on the campaign funding front, you know, you'll get run over. Mm. And I think that's one of the issues people have is that if you can you can spend your way to a win, although you you are an example of that not being the case, but maybe in a presidential election, things are a little different, right? Well, the, the, actually, they have public financing in presidential races. Most candidates now have just don't accept the public money because they don't want the limits because they can raise more money than they would be given under the public financing. We're going to find out because uh, if, if Donald Trump is the nominee, he has spent most of his campaign money, $40 million so far, on legal fees. So he will be outgunned, uh, you know, $100 million plus or hundreds of millions of dollars versus him having a fraction of that because he spent it all on legal fees. Yeah. So that brings me to the question, how is it legal for him to be able to spend campaign money on his legal bills? How is that possible? Isn't that a loophole? Well, he raised uh, when they incorporated his PAC, they provided that as a potential use. And you've always been able to use, you know, mm. uh, you know, your campaign money to pay your campaign treasurer. Or if you have to respond to the Fair Political Practices Commission, have hire a lawyer and using campaign funds for a legitimate purpose like that. Right. He just has more legitimate purposes than any candidate ever alive <laughs> in terms of legal fees. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. That's hilarious. Before we wrap this up, I, I, I had a thought last night. On your IRS filing every year, there's a little checkbox where you check to donate to a campaign. What's What's that all about? Well, because we have, theoretically, public financing of presidential campaigns. And so everybody who checks that mon that box off, the money goes into a pot, and then they split it amongst the candidates uh, once they are the nominees of their party. And in the you know good old days back of the in the George H. W. Bush year, I guess that's what they ran the campaign on, and that was their budget. Now, after George W. Bush and then Barack Obama and I, everybody else since then, people go, you know, that hundred million dollars is nice, but I can raise five hundred million, so I'm not going to take the federal money. I'm going to raise it over here and we'll be done with it. Is that an outdated thing? Should that be taken off the IRS thing? It probably should. <laughs> it probably helps third party candidates, but it, it's time has been overtaken by events. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think we've gotten some good insight into financing campaigns, and I'm sure as this podcast goes on, we'll be referring back to our discussion today about things that are going on in the campaign that maybe we can banter back and forth about. Absolutely. So that's that's great. So I think we are, we're off to a good start here, Keith. At the end of every episode, I want to be able to uh, throw out anything you'd, you'd like to talk about that's in the news politically right now, because we want to keep this timely as well. 
that is of interest to you right now, and maybe we can banter about a little bit on that. Well, as we all know, uh, Donald Trump is under indictment for 91 felonies and is, you know, ping-ponging back and forth between courts in four different jurisdictions, and he's not going to have a good year. Uh, just, just today, Rudy Giuliani was found to have libeled the two women in Georgia, and now they're going to have a court hearing to figure out how much money he's going to pay them. So we're going to have a situation where the Republican front runner is uh, going to be uh, in, in legal jeopardy for the entire entirety of the campaign. The unfortunate part is, is that the Democratic candidate has got some emerging issues as well. And I think for the first time, we now have a president who has used at least four aliases for his email address, Robin Ware, J.R.B. Ware, Richard L. Peters. Uh, I guess Celtic is his uh, is his uh, Secret Service name or Celtic. I they probably do it right. And uh, the big guy, of course, was one of his other uh, AKAs. <laughs> so. And I'll be the first to say it's a slowly developing case. It's slowly developing because unlike the Democrats who have the resources of the Department of Justice, uh, the Republicans have uh, Jim Comer and, and Jim Jordan, who are the two Inspector Clouseaus of congressional investigations. Oh, but nonetheless, ouch. Ouch. but nonetheless, <laughs> it was revealed today that there are in existence at the National Archives 5,400 emails or other records in which Joe Biden utilized an AKA in his communication. Now, we don't know what's in them. We don't know what they say, but that's all going to come out. And I just got to tell you, I could go through, you know, 4,500 of my emails or what is it, 4,500? 5,400 of my emails. And you'd find something in there pretty embarrassing. And I think that's probably going to be the case here because they were used exclusively in his communication regarding Hunter Biden's businesses. Well, so we're going to use a whole episode to go through your emails at, at some point. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, we don't know it yet, but right. it's coming. And, well, uh, and that's going to be a bad thing for America. Yeah. And I knew you were going to kind of talk about this. And so I, I did some research. I watched Fox News and they've already decided on Fox News that those emails are incriminating, but they never say that anybody's proven anything. And unlike, and that's why you're my co-host, by the way, because you disclaimer the fact that nothing's been tied to those emails yet. Now, the other thing I will say about emails is I've got about 15 email addresses too that I use and uh, nothing embarrassing in my emails. So I don't know what you're talking about, Keith. <laughs> There would be embarrassing things in the emails, but uh, uh, but you're right. We need to see where that takes us, and we will talk about that on this show. As I've always said, if someone is proven guilty of something or eligible for an indictment, they should be indicted. They should be punished to the fullest amount of the law, no matter what party they're in. So we will wait and see on this, right? Uh, we will. And, and that's the thing about it. And unfortunately, the campaign, other than being usually you, you look at political campaigns for president and they're either inspiring events that bring the country together or that help clarify the issues. This is going to be a slow moving train wreck on both sides. And for the Democrats, I mean, if Trump falls apart first, there's going to be a big move to find somebody not named Joe Biden to lead the ticket on the Democratic side. <laughs> and he may be so far ahead that they can't stop that. And mm. if the Republicans allow Donald Trump to lock up enough votes, it may be difficult to keep him off the Republican ticket. So it's a it's a it's a train wreck on both sides that needs to get resolved before they get past that point of no return. Otherwise, the election in the fall is just going to be a disaster. That's what makes this podcast so much fun, because <laughs> we're going to have a blast over the next couple of years. And uh we hope you, you'll you stay with us if you're a listener, because we're going to investigate all of this stuff and, and have some fun with it, because that's really what politics has become is entertainment. And so we're going to we're going to have some fun along with going through uh, Keith's emails at some point. So you, you'll <laughs> want to stay tuned for that. 
And uh, I want to thank you for joining us on our first episode of Solutions 2023. And we're going to change the name. We're open for suggestions there. We're going to add some theme music at some point, And we're, we're going to spice this thing up a little bit. But I want to thank you, Keith, for uh, for helping me through this first episode of Solutions 2023. Thanks, Mike. See you next time.